Coming up on All About Android, it's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our guest, David Emel, who is now working for MKBHD. So we talk a little bit about that. Also, app tracking on Android, Harmony OS by Huawei, Urbanista Miami headphone review, uh, Pixel Buds A series is now official, Stadia is now officially on Google TV, although pretty late, and Apple's Olive Branch to Android users. All that and so much more coming up right now on All About Android. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Audible. For a limited time, Amazon Prime members can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only $6.95 a month. Take advantage of this incredible limited time offer at audible.com slash allaboutandroid. And if you're listening after this limited time offer has expired and you're a new member, well, try Audible Plus for 30 days with a free trial at audible.com slash allaboutandroid or text allaboutandroid to 500 500. Hello, welcome to All About Android, episode 528, recorded on Tuesday, June 8th, 2021, your weekly source for latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. And I'm Ron Richards. And I'm Florence Ion. Oh, yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Yes. Maybe someday, Flo, we'll get you in the studio here. But I imagine it's kind of, it's got to be kind of difficult to do that drive when you've also got your job at Gizmodo and I feel like you're you're often riding right up to the edge of all about Android. That might not be possible. Yes. I yes, but why are we calling me out for this right? It's now? not it's not calling out. Hey, this is real life. It's a it's it's a I think what I'm doing is actually shining a light on how much of a hard worker you are. You, you are you. a hard worker. One of the, I, one of the hardest working that. people I know. Yes. She, Flo is Flo is a hard worker. Good work ethic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to try. Um it depends on my deadlines, but right now as we're going to find out in today's show, apparently it's been a busy week. <laughs> yeah, today's yeah, the Yikes. yesterday and today have been days where it's hard to find time to breathe. Uh let alone drive uh, long distances to come into the yeah. studio. Anyways, if someone wants to, if any of you watching want to see Flo in the studio, all you have to do is check out this week's Twit, twit.tv slash Twit, and True. she was on a pretty awesome episode. So Flo, it was good to see you on that panel. And that so great. it's good to see on this panel, our guest for the evening, David Immel at Dervid Immel on Twitter. Welcome back to the show. It's been a while, David. Hey guys, how you doing? Good Dude. to be back. Awesome. Been a while. Yeah, but it's always good to get you here, looking at your studio, your setup. I'm actually kind of impressed. You were talking before the show about how you were like, "Yeah, this is like my modest studio, or whatever." But oh, I think it looks pretty well. good. It looks like you're kind. Of, you could be in the middle of like an Apple commercial if you wanted to. Everything's all white <laughs> and stark. Yeah, yeah it I looks mean, like you just a, had a photo uh, shoot with yeah. a bunch of like people yeah. over like modeling phones with their hands. Yeah, I actually haven't used this in a while. Um, this used to be my bedroom, and then I had a dark room in like this small closet room area. And I decided that I don't need a lot of space to sleep in, so I decided to switch my dark room and my bedroom. So now my dark room slash studio is bigger, and my bedroom just basically fits exactly the size of my bed. That's so, that's, that's all you need. That's like a that's friend of mine friend of mine in San Francisco did a similar thing where he, uh, but instead of dark room and studio, it was pinball machines. And so he had a, I mean, he had a very large <laughs> closet that he was able to fit a mattress exactly yeah. in wall to oh. wall. And so he put yeah. that in the closet and then his living room and bedroom were filled with pinball machines. So <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yep. I just kind of figured uh, it's better to have more space for filming, but then pretty much after I finished this conversion, I got a new job and have not right. shot in here basically since then. So yeah, well, um, funny how that works. Yeah, right? totally. Right. <laughs> well, that just goes to show yeah, you, you yeah, never yeah. quite know how things are going to work out. But you got a pretty mm -hmm. awesome job, I have to say. And you know, last time you were on, you were not working for Marquez Brownlee's team, but now you are. Tell us a little bit about it. Like, when did you you started? Not too long ago. How is that going? What's what's your uh, your work life like right now? Yeah, um, I mean, I have more of a work-life balance than I have in the last, like, eight years, and it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I don't really know what to do with, like, my evenings because I used to just work every evening. So 
that's a transition and I guess it's something that I shouldn't complain about, but it's just a new thing. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's great. Uh, I think working with a lot of really cool people in a very cool space is awesome. And just having like longer conversations with people in an office, I haven't worked in a studio or like in a physical location for like seven years now, um, since I was at Intel and, so it's, yeah, it's, it's different. Like commuting kind of sucks, but like the experience of getting to work with people in real life and feel like I'm contributing to things is beneficial to my psyche. So I can't complain too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, right on. I know. Yeah. Um, it, it definitely takes a little bit of adjustment, right? When you're so used to working yourself to the bone and, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear how, like the perspective of being so used to working like crazy and then having to get used to time down. Like I feel like a lot of people are looking for the opposite, right? Like they're, they're, mm. they're working to the bone and they want that. But the reality is once you yeah. get there, you're right. It, it takes a little bit of time to like, under, like understand or feel okay with the fact that like, it's all right that you don't have everything planned right now. It's okay. Right. Like, how often do I just sit down and just like sit on the couch and like read a book or just, or just take a breath? It doesn't happen very often. It's mm-hmm, not saying that mm-hmm. it shouldn't. It's just, it's, I'm not used to that, that type of stillness. It's, so yeah. work-life no, balance I mean, thing, the work-life balance thing that for a lot of us that are like media content creators, where it's constantly like every minute you're not doing something, you're missing out. Yeah. On right. It. That's yeah. it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, which is honestly uh, Andrew, why, yeah. I appreciate that creators have started talking about burnout because I feel like in the media world, it's like, well, burning out. I mean, that that's how you get everything done. Like you need, that's <laughs> what you guys have to do. But it's like, now we're realizing it's actually not, not the healthy. best way to make content. <laughs> not great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I mean, at Android Authority, it's like I, I traveled and I did all the reviews and I made videos and I wrote articles and, and now it's like, I'm a, I'm a writer and a researcher. So like, I still, um, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing people and like scheduling things and like doing stuff for waveform and also like doing research for videos and trying to come up with like deeper insightful things to put in the videos, Mm -hmm. which is cool. Um, but like, it's so much less work overall that it's like, it's like almost uncomfortable for me. So I'm trying to like keep myself very busy by just like getting ahead of projects. And I think at this point I probably got like eight videos that I've done tons of research on and tons of thought on. And we basically have ready for shooting. So I'm like very ahead of schedule, but I guess uh, that's the only way to like keep myself comfortable. But like I said before, it's like, it's so good to just work with a lot of really talented people in one place. And uh, it's it's interesting to work physically with people again. Yeah. Cause I haven't Mm -hmm. done that so long yeah oh man i've just been stuck in this room for a year and a half now <laughs> not in yeah. this room but in our room in our yeah, room, so. yeah, yeah. Room. literally literally in like the majority of my day is spent in this chair in front of this microphone in front of this camera in a little mm. box from nine to seven and yeah it is <laughs> uh not fun but uh but we're getting there we're getting there so i'm glad to hear you you're yeah. uh, you're amongst people hopefully we'll get there soon yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well, congratulations yeah. on the on the transition. That's awesome. You're also working uh, there with uh, other, another friend of the show, Hayato Huseman, uh, who was on uh, last last year, anyways, and he's producing <laughs> for MKBHD. So it sounds like you guys are assembling a pretty awesome team. And I mean, obviously, working for an awesome guy, uh, MKBHD mm-hmm. is is great at what he does. So yeah, no, it's been fun. We like started a Discord channel for that. A lot of people have joined. That's been really fun and. Um, we're just expanding everything, basically. I think we have nice. like nine people now, which is kind of insane. That is insane. Um, wow, you're, yeah. you're you're approaching <laughs> yeah. the the number of people that work at Twit. I mean, you're about halfway there. I was so. gonna I was gonna say like at AA, I'm pretty sure our core team was like ten people. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a pretty insane. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, congratulations. Uh, I'm happy that even even in this new role, um, you're able to still, you know, come on the show and everything. And actually it sounds like you yeah. have the time to do it. So yeah, <laughs> reach out I know. More I often. It's, very often that it's probably not very often that people are like, I have too much time. Uh, yes. Do this. this new job. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, yeah, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, it's great to get you on though. It's good to have you back. And we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. So why don't we jump right into it? Burke, I hope that that trigger finger is ready because it's time for the news. 
I can't opt out on you, Android News. <laughs> hmm. 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 Okay. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to think about that one. I'm going to ponder hmm. it a little bit. Flo, you got to hmm. think about it. Yeah, uh, Burke is actually <laughs> referencing a new little feature that is coming through to Android 12 first. So Google is actually planning to allow Android users to opt out of third-party app tracking. So this is a feature that's going to come a little bit later this year. You can read all about it in my article at gizmodo.com. Um, but for just the short, the short summary... Basically, this is going to give you the ability to turn off sharing of the advertising ID. Uh, and what it will do is it will replace that ID with basically a bunch of null numbers, zero, zero, zeros. So any app that is requesting access for that won't get that information that you're trying to keep from marketers and third party uh, advertisers. Now, it's unclear if this tracking feature is going to be off by def uh, on or off by default. And we're not going to find out for a while because this rollout is phased for Android 12 devices in late 2021. And then more devices will come in 2022. It's an interesting time for this kind of feature just because Apple announced so many different privacy features for iOS 14. We know there's a couple new things coming through the pipeline for iOS 15 from WWDC yesterday. So it's kind of a race between the two companies now like, who, which one of us can say we're private? And, uh, you know, this is one way for Google to do it. And it's a nice little supposedly opt-in thing that it'll give us. But remember, it doesn't mean it totally opts us out of Google's tracking. But that's a, that's a thing for another day. <laughs> right. Third party is there for a reason. Yeah. We're here to talk about third parties. Third party, not for first sure. parties. Well, what I thought was kind of interesting about this too is that um, Google has offered, when in their settings, the ability to opt out of ad tracking uh, before. But from my understanding, anyways, I didn't realize this before reading some of the articles, yours and Ron Amadio's and everything, mm -hmm. is that. Even though there's a toggle for opting out of of advertising, uh, tar you know, tar targeted advertising or whatever, um, I, I'm interpreted, you know, the coverage to say that still um, app developers were able to kind of work around that anyways, and so th hence the reason why in this new kind of version of it, they're act they would actively be nulling out the advertiser ID. So even if the app developer were to do whatever it happened to be that allowed them to still do the tracking, they'd get no usable data. It would just be zeros instead of an actual ad ID. But I didn't know that a yeah. developer could bypass that. And and if they can or they could, what what did that look like? I, I just hadn't really heard of that before. I think it was Google offering to opt out of its advertising feature because uh, that advertising okay. ID is, is the thing that follows you from app to app. So... Yeah. This is targeting SDKs from what I was reading from developers talking about this on Twitter. Yeah. This targets SD third party SDKs. So the the out of Google advertising companies that you can contract if you know you make like an indie game and you decide to go with this like SDK. Right. Those were the ones that were tracking you from app to app. I do want to also note that I have a slight theory. Part of this was discovered around the time that we discovered, remember the COVID-19 tracing wasn't completely private. And mm. the thing that was being leaked was the OEM's access to that advertising ID, plus a bunch of other things that could, and that advertising oh, ID okay. can identify you. It identifies your choices. It identifies the, the apps that you go in, like how quickly you click on something. So hmm. yeah, it's, it's all, um, it all sounds like, you know, and this is something that I'm going through right now. So it's a very like timely metaphor, but you know, when like you're trying to seal up the house with caulking so that the bugs aren't coming through all little holes. Yeah. <laughs> Been there. Again, this is happening to me in real life. It's like that time of year in California. That's kind of what I feel like Google's doing with some of these things. Like, mm. Hey, just want to let you know, we like patched up this little corner over there. <laughs> By the way, we're safe. <laughs> You're, you're safe from them. You're not safe from us, but you're safe from them 
It's okay. Yeah, you're uh, safe from one kind of bug, but not from the other kind. Not of from bug. the Google bug. What do you think, David? Do you think uh, we need a more robust app tracking blocking system? Uh, maybe something similar to what Apple's been rolling out? Because I mean, Apple really went went uh, in like a, a deeper direction than what it seems Google's doing here. Apple's like, yeah, we're, we're opting people out by default. And if you actually want to be tracked, you opt in. Should Google adopt that? What do you think about that? Yeah, so this is a really interesting topic. I think uh, there's obviously been so many disputes. It's kind of fun to watch the bickering between like Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook and have them kind of like subtweet each other constantly yeah, right. uh, about this. <laughs> um, but you can't really argue against it because fundamentally, like you're, you, you should know whether apps are tracking you, and you should be able to say you don't want them to, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I did turn off ad tracking on the iPhone that I use, um, and it was a very poor experience. <laughs> um, I started seeing yeah. like extremely, both extremely generic ads for just like, like very low budget, very low relevance ads, which I guess is the point, that makes right? Sense, yeah. Um, but I started to be a little even more frustrated by the ads that I was getting than when they were tracking me. Huh. So like, for example, when I was having ads track me, all of like Instagram ads, for example, are like notoriously creepily good at like knowing exactly what you like. So I would get ads for like um, water bottles with California national parks on it or um, film development services that you can have online, which are like, you know, smaller companies. And not that I was going to actually purchase these things, but it felt a little more natural to like my life to have it in my feed of things mm -hmm. versus just like after I turned it off, I just started getting ads for like generic underwear brands and then also <laughs> and then also just influencers that are apparently oh. paying to have themselves and their pages be ads on Instagram. And I really don't yep. want to see any of that. Um, so it had me like very <laughs> conflicted. I'll tell you that. Like I, I actually did end up turning it back on because like even though I don't like that I'm being tracked around the internet, I am, think I'm willing to give up my data for a better experience because ads do run the internet at the end of the day and nothing can be free. So like, if that's going to be the case, I'm, I'm personally okay with it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing is that like turning it or turning off the tracking doesn't mean you're not going to get ads. It's not an ad blocker. It just means you're not mm -hmm. going to get personalized ads that are relevant to you. Um, and it also, and it also reminds me, my wife and I were talking this weekend and she said she read some article, I forgot the source, but you know how we, we've joked about how the phones are listening and even though Facebook and Instagram say that they're not, but you know, it's uncanny mm -hmm. when you're hanging out with people and you all start to get the same ads. There's actually with the tracking, they are implementing common lookalike, uh, targets. So like. I'm tracked. My wife's tracked. They know that we're together a lot. Right. My wife is getting targeted type of ad. So mm -hmm. I start getting targeted it. So I can be like, Hey, I saw this ad and like, and it's working. Like it's totally. literally, like, right. you know? And so, and part of it is, is that, and I will say that like, no one loves advertising. No one loves, you know, like all, all this sort of stuff, but given the choice of generic underwear companies or influencers <laughs> or, yeah ads that are actually relevant to my interest and like Instagram, I'll give them credit. I discovered in the app. Now you can go back and see like ads I've clicked on mm -hmm, and I've gone back. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh yeah, I like that shirt or, Oh, I wanted to get that. They're like, about that. like they're, they're these, they're these really cool surge, uh, strips that are made. They're all retro kind of. And I'm like, I was like trying to find it. I was like, Oh yeah, I actually want that. I was served this ad and it's mm -hmm. relevant to me. So, you know, like, you know, it goes back to the privacy concern, and I know I'm I'm the unpopular opinion of saying that my life isn't that interesting, that I've got so much to protect from you know the, from being tracked. But it's like it's given me a pretty good experience. So I, I agree with you, David. I think it's worth it. The the, the uh, value proposition is there. It's proving itself finally. Yeah, it almost feels like a little bit of a hot take to say that I'm okay with the ad tracking because yeah. I think everyone's <laughs> kind of supposed to be like not okay with it. I think that it's a net good that people have the option. I think that was important, and mm -hmm. I think it's good that Google is now catching up with Facebook because you should be able to say, I want my data to be only mine or I'm okay with it being shared. But personally, I'm okay with it being shared if it means that I'm not going to have to see influencers in my feed constantly. So, yeah. <laughs> it's fair. It's 
Fair. <laughs> Fair. That's that's all I have to say about it. Fair. That. I don't blame you. Also, how many times can you advertise a press on nail to me? Like I'm it, <laughs> I'm Endless. not stuck at home anymore. I don't need press on nails. It's fine. Yes, you do. You need all the press on nails. Florence Ion, ID 349928. <laughs> 7K Whatever. apostrophe Y. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> Buy our thing. You need to. All right. Well, let's transition away from ad tracking and toward <laughs> Huawei. Away? Away? Oh, let's, or oh, Huawei. Away. Or let's I transition know. Huawei. I love uh, that after 10 years of doing this show, any opportunity to do wordplay with Huawei, we will take it. Yes, so, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> that's that's our shtick at this point. And we're not the only ones, by the way. We certainly sure, didn't invent it. By the way, by the Huawei. It never gets but, old. Yeah. Don't go I to the L. I work and they hate me too, so don't worry about it. <laughs> All right, cool. By the Huawei. <laughs> good, good company. <laughs> Huawei finally unveiled their new OS. We'll put that in... in uh, in uh, air quotes only because, well, I'll tell you in a second, but it's called Harmony OS. Um, and basically, so they had an event where they kind of showed this off. They introduced a couple of devices that are going to be the first devices to run their new Harmony OS. This is all in response to the trade ban that happened a couple of years ago. We're now at year two of Huawei being banned uh, in the U.S. And, you know, uh, Huawei is, is restricted from using even, you know, uh, components that are sourced in the U.S. So they really uh, had to had to kind of recreate everything as far as their smartphones are concerned. Uh, they're still not available, uh, you know, to or allowed to sell their devices in the U.S. even. But, um, you know, they still want to continue their smartphone uh, and efforts and mobile efforts and everything. So they created Harmony OS to kind of circle, a, a, you know, their way around the um, reliance upon Android. But that's where things kind of get weird. From what I understand, from what I've heard and read and everything, code base is practically the same as Android. Huawei has been cagey about the underlying code in here, told some publications that the OS has AOSP underpinnings that kind of keep things um, underneath, you know, uh, consistent, keep existing users happy with the experience, that sort of thing. But then to other publications, they've declined to comment when the questions about those underpinnings are actually asked in a direct way. So it's kind of like, okay, well, do you care or don't you care? Or is there something to, to be reveal here or not? Whatever. They, 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 you know, they can't seem to get their story straight so as far as that's concerned. Um, they're also talking about Harmony OS being the same for wearables as well as smartphones and tablets. Huawei's calling both of them, you know, the OS on both of those different platforms, Harmony OS, yet apparently they're very different. The watch is running an altered version of its Lite OS, but they call it Harmony OS. The smartphones and tablets, they're running an altered version of its previous Android fork, but it's also called Harmony OS. So a little bit of confusion there as far as like, okay, well, what's what's what here? Because they both aren't the same, if that's if that's the case. Um uh, and also, Ron Amadio pointed out that Amazon, you know, in its Fire devices, Amazon, of course, famously forked, you know, Android for its Fire devices. And uh, Amazon is pretty upfront as far as that. Huawei is being, again, super cagey about the fact that this is an Android fork, uh, which is just kind of weird. So anyways, as far as the um, OS itself kind of looks, you know, sim similar to what we've seen before from Huawei, but also similar to iOS, you know, in, in many ways. Um, Huawei did say that they plan on updating around 100 Huawei devices to Harmony OS over the coming year. So that could be interesting, taking one thing and updating it to a completely new OS, although it's not really completely new because it's still running on Android to a certain degree. So anyways, that's kind of the lowdown on Huawei's Harmony OS. I'm just curious uh, what you all think of this after a couple of years of lead up. And, and I, I should also uh, make sure and remind you that they didn't just start working on this two years ago. They, they had been working on this to some degree prior because there was always the question or there had been the question before this whole trade ban uh, that, that Huawei had considered, like, well, maybe we break away from Android and do our own thing. Apparently, breaking away from Android and doing your own thing still involves Android. So I think that's pretty interesting. But what do you guys think? Anyone who wants to go, throw that ball in the air. <laughs> um, I'll start. Flow. So... 
from what I understand, since they built it on uh, the same framework that you could basically go and download an APK of your choosing, even without the Play Store, and get the apps that you want. So from, yeah, I mean, for, for the user, I guess that's a good thing, right? Which, uh, is, ma which is making me think that this is not going to be like the worst fork in the world, <laughs> I guess, to put it, to put it that way. It just it's seems like a way to subvert. It's, it's not the worst fork in the world. <laughs> it's not the worst fork. It has all. What would you say is the worst have. fork in the world? What's the worst oh. fork Android? A What's spork. the fork Android? <laughs> the the spork? spork would be the worst fork because it is neither a good fork or a good spoon. Just a mm. hot. There it is. Yeah. Just yeah. decide yeah. what you okay. are. A spork. All right. <laughs> now imagine that in the Android world. <laughs> so there it is. Fire <laughs> OS would be that. Fire OS. Fire yeah. OS, it's not a good e-reader and it's not a good tablet. Just make a Kindle. Just get a Kindle. Yeah. And then get an iPad. I, <laughs> yep. Sorry. I would agree. <laughs> I, I would agree. As an Android fan, I would agree. There are a lot of consumers yeah. that are perfectly happy with what Fire OS actually is. Yeah, but, but I don't agree with that. Personally, I don't it, agree with that. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are not really very many good Android tablets as it is. So. Yeah, totally. The pickings yeah. are slim. Yeah. yeah. So you get what you get. Android tablets? What? What are you guys talking about? <laughs> kind of not even. Anana, a thing anana. Yes. There's there's <laughs> Amazon and then there's Anana. 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 I don't know. I think this Harmony OS thing. I mean, the fact that it's just a fork of Android is just super disappointing. Yeah. To me, at least, just because it, it was like it was like okay, cool. You're gonna ban us. We're gonna make our own OS, and we've been working on it for years and all this sort of stuff. And it's like okay, cool. We're gonna get like a new player in the world and. It's just not like and so like I, from a drama level, um, yeah. I find it super disappointing, but they're doing what they got to. And that's the and isn't this the whole what Android was built on? Right. I mean, sure. it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, so it's not I guess it's not a surprise. I just I had higher hopes for Huawei personally. I want to show you guys my level of shock based on my expression. <laughs> Oof. And that is that, that is, is so steel. shock, David. <laughs> I. Yes, it's that totally not a poker face. To know. It's like, look, I it's it's Huawei, and not to you know put them down or anything, but and because they made great devices for a very long mm -hmm. time, but it's always kind of been like this with them. Yeah, you, know, you you always ask a question, and they're always just like, we're going to give you either multiple answers or no answer at all, and their whole like we've been working on this for years thing really just makes it seem like they're trying to make sure they don't go out of business. Not that they're going to go out of business because they have a giant telecom company in China, but um, I don't know. As far as the naming conventions, like I really think they should have done like Harmony Wear and right. Harmony Mobile. Mm -hmm. right. But at the same time, like I guess the whole idea of Harmony is that everything is one and ultimately they're probably trying to be a little bit more like Apple where like everything kind of runs the same thing or is moving towards running the same thing. Um, which is kind of a segue into your next point about Huawei, actually. So I'll let you take the reins there uh, in terms of the, the iPad OS type style. Thing. Oh, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. The, the, David read the doc. Oh, like wow. A very David, good quit guess. reading. Well, I'm yeah, impressed. I mean, I don't I don't really have a whole lot of extra to say about iOS. It was, it was really just, I mean, it's all... First of all, it's very timely because we have WWDC, and this is not the only time in the show when we'll, we'll uh, mention Apple. But, I mean, Huawei has, like, you know, Huawei is just one of those companies that has made almost no qualms over the years of showing their kind of affinity for what Apple has done and wanting to replicate it. They are certainly not the only company in the in the Android, you know, sphere that is yeah. doing that. There's a lot of, of, of that going on. But Huawei, especially in the in the case of their UI and some of the choices that they make, really does um, seem to kind of do a lot of, of being influenced by, by Apple as far as that's concerned. It's just some of the screenshots that I've seen of Harmony OS, I have not used it, but definitely have that iOS appeal or that iOS kind of um, kind of approach. To it, yeah, so. it seems like it's it seems like Android that is just trying to look as much like iPad OS or iOS as yeah. it can. Yeah, and that's kind of always been the traditional um, like Chinese manufacturer take on things, and that's why I think as Western media we've kind of given them a lot of crap is because like they kind of do this thing where you know there's no app drawer and everything tries to be like overly simplistic, but as like Android users we kind of want like the more customizable, maybe more information-dense experience. 
And I think we've seen a lot of OEMs move towards that. Like uh, Oppo, in my opinion, has come a really long way from offering one of the worst OSs in the game to one of the best. And yeah. so it would be nice if we saw Huawei do a similar thing, but I can see what they're trying to do, especially since they, they try to mirror Apple in every way possible. Same with Xiaomi, but, you know, Huawei tries to mirror Apple in every way yeah. possible. They offer one of the only Android tablets on the market, so of course they're going to try to mirror what is popular right now because yep. otherwise, you know, what are they going to do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, anywho, um, you know, here in the U.S., we're not really going to see these devices, like I said. Uh, so Harmony OS is going to be an interesting thing to watch from afar, I think, for most of us. But we have Huawei's next big thing. And meh, meh. That's kind of how it feels right now. Don't while wait for it. Ah! It'll uh, <laughs> come and go. David, you'll be here all week. And by that, we mean oh. on this episode until next week's episode. So <laughs> there you go. Don't forget, don't forget to tip your David. Um, so moving on from the way of Huawei uh, to the Pixel way. Pixel way. Uh, those of you who are interested in we got some Pixel news to drop for you. Um, locked folder was announced at Google I.O., now there will be a button in the camera UI to save photos to that locked folder destination on the Pixel. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, Ash, Astrophotography now offers a night sight time lapse in video mode, uh, which okay. is required to be on the Pixel 4 or newer. So all of you night photographers, there you go. That's like interesting. That. Um, three new Pride themed wallpapers. Uh, very timely, being this month's Pride Month. Also, Pride themed ringtones and notification sounds. So, show your Pride on your Pixel uh, with these wallpapers and ringtones and notification sounds. Um, and a new call feature in Google Assistant. Uh, when a call comes in, you can say, hey, G, answer call or reject call, um, as well as a few other new uh, features as well. And, and these are neat, but I still. I don't know. I know, like the, the 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 desire of these is to make you want to get a Pixel, but they're never enough to be. And I'm, I'm, I say this as a Pixel owner, but I feel like if I was shopping, I'd be like, oh well, you know, I can save photos to a to a locked folder only on this phone. Like, it doesn't seem that compelling enough. But they're nice little value adds, I guess. Yeah, we were talking earlier about kind of like the line between one thing or another, and I could have placed that right here. What is the line that's drawn between, like a feet, like a like an I don't know, like like just a random feature being added to an app and a reason to roll out a major update for a phone. Like sometimes they they feel so similar. It's just here, I guess it's like four features to four apps all at the same time versus those just happening in an app update. Um, but but at the same time, as a Pixel user, am I happy that they that Google does this? Yeah, shows shows me that they're. Well, this is what's to entice attention. you to buy it. Yeah, totally. This is it's why you want to buy deal. the Pixel. Right. Whether the features are actually, you know, worthy uh, of of that status, or or whether the features in and of themselves are like, holy cow, I have to have that astrophotography video feature. That's like a game changer. I'm sure there's someone well, out there who could say that. That but. that will be. Listen, I'll use it next time I go camping, and then you'll yeah. get like a cute little gif or something yeah, on right. Twitter. So that'll. That'll be worth it. But at least with regard to the locked photos, um, it's never, you know, it's like super exciting, but it's never quite what you're thinking. What do you mean? Well, the locked photos is is truly just photos that are locked away and you can't do anything with them. Right. They're locked in a little probably an a, encrypted a folder that, yeah. that all, you have to have a password in order to access. But I mean, you Nothing can't do new. anything with them. You can't send them to a photo book. So if you wanted to, let's say I wanted to make a photo book of all my driver's licenses. So what do you, so, okay. So exp explain <laughs> this, uh, flow. Cause I'm, I'm don't know that I'm following. If I put a full, a photo into a locked folder, I can then do nothing with it. Like I can't export it out of there or share it or anything. Yes. Read, read my article on gizmodo.com. Uh, I, I, oh, I, I did. I'm merely pointing people to it in a smart, no, I mean, wise I, way. No, in all sincerity, first of all, Android Police, I think, is the one where I originally learned about this. Was it Android Police or 9to5Google? Google? Anyway, both of those sites are doing the Lord's work. So bless both of you. But um, I learned that the locked photo is literally just for like this very sensitive data that you don't want 
sensitive photos, I should say that you are not going to do anything with. You're not going to edit it. You're not going to share it to Instagram. You're not going to even like put it in a live photo album because once you move it out of that locked folder, it just gets, it goes poof. Hmm. It disappears. That's that's what the support that's what the support page makes. That doesn't it sound seem like, like a good feature. Yeah, that seems. Yeah, it doesn't seem great. That's why that's why it doesn't. This is not like what we think it is. This is not like oh, I could store my photos in Google Photos without Google tracking me. No, this is you can put your driver's license into a special folder that nobody can get to, or I guess if you're hiding a wedding ring which the Google blog suggests as an example, you could put a picture of that wedding ring in there. I must take a picture of this wedding ring. Yeah. And I think store it's, it's it somewhere a very safe. Limited, I have very to. Very limited access thing. Um, because, yeah, in addition to not showing up anywhere, it's some very super limited access. So oh, Interesting. I mean, Can I make I, a... Yeah. Yeah, go go no no go ahead, no, go no you you you're gonna make something very compelling a point very compelling. I was gonna I was gonna make a hot take about these pixel feature drops, but it wasn't specifically about the the, the photos thing. Doesn't um, matter. What's your hot take? It doesn't matter. Yeah, the okay. whole concept. Let's hear it. My 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 hot take is that feature the pixel feature drops are they do multiple good things mostly for Google um, because they make it feel like Google is supporting your phone for a lot longer than they do. Not that they don't support your phone for a long time mm. already because Pixel is better than, you know, it has more support than a lot of other phones already. But um, most updates that we get over our devices are like, it says like security improvements and like slight feature improvements. Like you don't, you don't really know what's happening behind the scenes most of the time when you get like a 0.001 update, right? Mm -hmm. It's only like the big like, oh boy, we're moving from Android 10 to Android 11, Android 11 to Android 12. And then it's like, okay, what's new? You know, and like before, before they did these feature drops on the Pixel, sometimes a random like Android 14.1.5 would add something like this locked photo feature. And that, I guess it, it just made it so people like didn't really realize what was coming out or it was such a low amount of news that people didn't know it was coming out. So this does multiple things. By, by creating these feature drops, it makes it feel make customers feel like Google is kind of like supporting them as a customer far after they purchase the device, right? Mm -hmm. Which is an important thing for their PR, right? Because uh, Apple is known for supporting. Now they have, now that iOS 15 is coming out and they support the iPhone 6S, that's like six years of devices they're supporting, right? So if yeah. Google wants to get on a near similar basis, they want to make customers feel like they're they're really giving them a lot. So by doing these feature drops and kind of like waiting to roll out a bunch of features at the same time, it almost feels like you're getting a full Android update um, instead of just like one small feature came out this month and then in two months, maybe we get the astrophotography right. night mode video. And it, people just don't talk about it as much. So I think, honestly, it's funny. It's it's like mostly a PR thing, but at the same time, it does make the consumer feel a little bit better about their device when you get these feature drops because it feels like you kind of get like a refresh of your Pixel experience. Yeah, totally. Um, right. So so that that's that's mostly my hot take. That take was hot. Drops. I will say right. that I also have been slightly disappointed by most of the feature drops after like the first one. The first one like added a lot of really big new features, and I think they mm -hmm. were planning on it to mostly feel that way. Uh, but they haven't really added like a ton of new crazy stuff. Like there's that like car crash detection. There was uh, I think the earthquake detection was yeah. added in the first yep. feature drop too, which is like big, major, cool, googly computational update that uses like all these devices. But you know, I so. We'll see. I think it's it's just a way for them to make consumers feel like they're being supported after they buy the device. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a good hot take. I mean, it's I, I wouldn't even say that that's that that much like incendiary. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it definitely gives a a feeling of investment in the phone when really they're mm -hmm. just kind of bells and whistles. So yeah, right. They were gonna they were gonna give those features away anyway. It's just that right. it was gonna be in the form of three point one updates instead of just holding them on all back and saying like. Look at this major update that adds all these things. So, mm -hmm. right. right, unlike an Apple update, which will just push through everything that you need in one update, and then that's it until next year. Exactly. Right. But everybody really looks forward to those. Yeah, you know and everybody's I mean? on the same page. 
once they get there. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's how Google used to operate too with like most big Android updates um, and still kind of mostly how they do. It's just that like, I don't know, Google wanted a reason for people to feel like they were being supported more yeah. than two to three years after they bought their phone, specifically because the iPhone now gets six years of support. So Yeah, yeah, it drives a lot of attention to the fact that Google is updating. A lot of times these security updates come through and that's all it is and for better or for worse, a lot of people can't really get excited about a security update. Not that you're meant to, but exactly. at least with a, fe a feature drop, it's like, oh, I got all that stuff and I got this cool new stuff. I didn't yeah. know my phone could do that. You know, My dad's yeah. definitely not going to update his phone if it says security updates and improvements because right. he just thinks that his phone will change settings for him. But mm -hmm. if it's like astrophotography night mode and he loves camping and he wants to do this feature and I tell him there's this new feature, but you got to update, then he will update for it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, parents! We gotta we gotta school <laughs> our parents on our technology. So that's that's one common feature among all of us, I think. Because mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my parents are the same. No, no, definitely no. Oh man, my sister! I would visit my sister, and she would have you know an old Samsung phone, and you know it it had that ever present like your phone needs to update, and she and I'm oh, like how yep. how long has that I, been there? She's like I don't I know, know a couple of years. Like I never pushed <laughs> oh, my phone to, to update. I'm like right. my dad too. It's yeah. <laughs> uh. Anyways, all right. Well, let's take a break. Thank the sponsor, and uh, when we come back from that, we're going to talk about some uh, some hardware news. I actually have a quick review of some pretty uh, cool uh, wireless headphones that I have here. So we've got more stuff to come. But first, this episode of All About Android is brought to you by Audible. Audible's so great. Forget about last summer. It, th right now, we're in this summer. And as you probably have already realized, this summer's a whole lot different from last summer, at least at least for, for many of us anyways. Uh, we've all been inside for the last year. Um, so, you know, it's time to have some fun. Hopefully, we're kind of loosening up, having a good time, and, and kind of getting a chance to escape from from the last year <laughs> and it's time to celebrate audible's actually celebrating uh the best season of the year like they never have before uh with so many great stories and programs audible is the perfect summer partner for you and now is the best time to do it because prime members can save 53 percent off their first four months that is huge with Audible, you can listen to more of whatever you're into because Audible has everything, an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, tons of binge-worthy podcasts and exclusive originals, all available uh, to download or to stream. And here's what you get. As an Audible member, you can choose one title per month. I've been on this plan for years now. Uh, so maybe it's the latest bestseller or you know a hot new release. It's yours to keep forever. So when you when you use that, you know, make that choice, that audiobook is yours going forward. Uh, but here's the best part. You also get at full access to Audible's streaming library, the Plus Catalog. So you can discover your next podcast obsession. You can check the, that audiobook off your bucket list that you've been waiting to, to listen to or get lost in a world of original content from celebrity creators, best-selling authors, leading experts, the kind of stuff you can't hear anywhere else. That's why Audible is so great. You can stream all you want as much as you want. Now, Audible is the perfect companion for summer because no matter where you happen to be going or what you're doing, you're always going to have just or want and and with Audible have just the right thing to listen to at your fingertips. So, you know, it's perfect for road trips. It's perfect for lazy beach days. If you're lounging around and you want to rest your eyes, you can just listen to the, the audiobook instead. Uh, long bike rides, barbecuing in the backyard. I listen when I'm doing the dishes. I mean, really, that's the beauty is that you can fill the time that normally it would just be you doing this thing or, or this chore or or whatever. And now suddenly you're listening to this amazing audiobook and learning something in the process. Um, an audiobook that I'm listening to right now is called Untangled. It's by Lisa Damore. This is a, a book, an audiobook that is, oh, it's actually kind of hard to listen to because my daughter's you know, they're eight and 11. So my oldest is kind of on the verge of becoming a teenager. 
and I wanted to listen to an audiobook that could help me because everybody that I talked to has said over the years since we've had, you know, uh, since we've had kids that watch out when they, you know, become teenagers, everything changes. I'm like, okay, I've, I've heard that a million times. How? Exactly how? And so Entangled is really all about that. It's, it's really about, and it's, and it's uh, specific to uh, girls. But so for me, you know, it's perfect. It's really just about how teenage girls kind of transition into adulthood and what to expect and uh, how to navigate through that. And it's just, it's fantastic. I'm learning so much. I'm fearing a little bit, but I'm feeling more empowered by it. And I think that's the point. So that's called Untangled by Lisa Damore. Right now, for a limited time, Amazon Prime members can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only $6.95 a month. If you're not an Amazon Prime member, uh, what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon and sign up so you can get this deal and so much more. Uh, get more out of summer with Audible to take advantage of this awesome limited time offer. Go to audible.com slash allaboutandroid. If you're listening after the limited time offer has expired and you're a new member, well, you can try Audible Plus for 30 days with a free trial. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash allaboutandroid or text allaboutandroid to 500 500 and uh, yeah, check it out for yourself. Audible is one of those things that once you sign up and you start listening to audiobooks, you're never going to want to stop. It's just, it's such a great way to fill the time. So Audible, thank you for sponsoring All About Android and the Twit Network. And Flo says in back channel, welcome to your doom. I have to imagine this has to do with, <laughs> with, my, with my daughter on the verge of becoming a teenager. Um, no, uh, I meant to Ron coming back, but I did. I <laughs> had nothing I to do with it. I felt for you. I felt for you, Jason, <laughs> when you were reading that ad. Uh, all right. All right. Good. That's, that's all I'm looking for. I just want to be understood. That's all that's I'm looking all. for. Oh, I, I get it. <laughs> and you can always text me if you ever need a perspective. Thank you, Flo. I will take of a, of that. a young emotional girl. There we go. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. Look, I've, I've got ten, I've got 10 years to go before that happens for my daughter, but I'm not looking forward 10 to 10 years it. may seem like a long time. It's not run. Okay. Oh <laughs> <laughs> it's time for some hardware news. Let's do it. All right. Um, so this is going to be kind of, you know, in, in previous episodes, we've done like a, a quick, quick review. Um, so not spending a huge amount of time on, on the review, but really kind of giving just some perspective on a product that I've had for a little while that I've been enjoying. Uh, it definitely has some, some thumbs up and it has a couple of thumbs down, which I'll get to in a second. But um, I'm curious, David, have you heard of the brand Urbanista? The headphone brand never, from never in my from, entire life from Sweden. So I had been not been no. familiar with them up until um, when I was reviewing some headphones from Sennheiser and kind of came across their path. And now I've uh, th now I've had the opportunity to review. This is the second pair of headphones that I've reviewed um, from Urbanista, and uh, definitely seems from my experience with Urbanista hardware is that their focus is definitely about uh, audio hardware that is less expensive than kind of the analog. So like, the, for instance, what I'm, what I'm reviewing here is the Urbanista Miami, which if I had to like compare to uh, headphones, you know, that they might compare closely with, with uh, features and stuff, you might throw these up against the AirPods Max. It's just the difference is the AirPods Max are 549. These are $149, right? So it's a lot less expensive, but they've kind of got, um, Urbanista really has, the kind of the, the price consciousness in mind, but they also have kind of like the, a style perspective. Um, both, both of the products that I've had of Urbanista and definitely looking through their product catalog online, you just see that they're really kind of devoted to creating products that, um, that yes, they, they sound good, but they also just kind of have a nice, unique kind of style quality to them. They don't look like a big piece of technologies, uh, which often a lot of the the stuff that, that we use, it looks like it's made by a technology company. And granted, I mean, 
obviously Urbanista is a technology company, but these things kind of blend into kind of modern style and stuff. So I think that's a that's a thumbs up for them. Some people might not care as much as far as kind of the style and the unique design and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but other people, it matters a lot. So um, these headphones uh, have like an aluminum outer shell here. Uh, you know, a nice soft padding. It's, you know, it's not like real leather. It's more like a pleather, but it's soft and cushiony. One of the, I would say one of the, the big, uh, upsides to the Miami's is the, uh, battery. It has a 750 milliamp hour battery that's rated at 50 hours on a full charge. And you can charge that with a type C. So it's a fast charge. And, uh, yeah, I mean, th th there was one thing with these headphones. I probably, you know, been spending last couple of months with these things. And, uh, I really rarely ever had to think about battery. It was pretty, pretty awesome to like not have to even consider it. And most of the time when I was using them, I was using active noise cancellation, which is a feature as well. And so that makes it even more impressive, right? Like that, that all of that battery life that I was getting out of these, uh, I had active noise cancellation on, which can generally be kind of a battery hog as well. So that's, that's good. You've got on-ear detection. So if you see inside of the cup, there's a little, a little sensor on the inside there. So that, that can tell, uh, when you're, um, here, I'll sh show you again, uh, when it's on your head, when you take these off, it's going to pause the music for you. That's great. Uh, Bluetooth 5.0 also has a, a regular audio, um, uh, hardware audio jack, which it comes with the cables that you need in order to, uh, you know, like we used it in our, um, in our vehicle to plug into the system there. My kids used it. And uh, so that gives you a little bit of flexibility there. You do have some onboard buttons and everything. They're a little flush. It's kind of hard to show because these are black, but they're a little, you know, flat and flush. So sometimes it can be kind of hard to know whether you've actually pushed it um, when you're on the go, uh, but they are there for some basic controls. Uh, like I said, active noise cancellation. I would say the the ANC on these is, you know, obviously it's not like the best noise cancellation in the world, but in this price category, that's that's not a bad feature to be offering, uh, and I think it does the job pretty well. It's um, It has a very tight fit on the head. I can actually put it on real quick here. So it kind of, it kind of has a seal uh, just by, just by the cups themselves. And then with the active noise cancellation, um, it just does a good job of kind of sealing things out, uh, based on how the cups fit over my ears anyways. Um, also has an ambient sound mode. So it lets through kind of stuff in the environment. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, you do get some wind noise though, when, um, when you're using that, if it's really windy as it has been here in the Bay area, like crazy, we've been getting tons of wind. So you get a little bit of that kind of sound sometimes that can be a little annoying, mm. but, um, as you can see, it has a nice carrying case and everything. Uh, but these are headphones. So really, you know, the, the overall focus is audio and this is, this is of the, um, of the ethos where, you know, accentuating the low end is uh, definitely a priority or definitely a focus of these headphones. So you get a lot of that low-end frequency response. Um, depending on the type of music you're listening to, that sounds really great. Other types of music, maybe not so much, but if you're listening to pop or dance, uh, hip-hop, that sort of stuff, um, and you appreciate the overhyped kind of low-end approach, you'll probably like these headphones. And if you don't, you might want to look elsewhere. Um, not entirely transparent in other frequencies, but um, I, you know, I liked a lot of the music that I listened to. Definitely opted more for listening to music than listening to like podcasts or audiobooks and that sort of stuff. Um, I feel like these lend themselves more to the music experience. Um, what you don't get, you don't get any IP rating. You don't get a companion app, and by extension, you don't get any EQ, which is a bummer because I think with that accentuated low end, you could really use uh, stand to benefit from having that. Apparently, that app is coming later this year, but it's not out. But I would say my main complaint, if I had one major complaint with these, uh, the Urban East of Miami's, it's that um, the the it's basically it's comfort. When I put these on my head, and I don't know, you know, I saw other reviews. And I only saw a few people complaining of the same thing. Feels fine for a while, but it's pushing like over time. Like I can only really wear them for maybe an hour or two at a time at tops. I feel like it pushes into my ears 
and my head so tightly <laughs> that it's fine for a while. But then at a certain point, my ears and my head start to ache a little bit. Um, could be my big fat head, uh, but something to consider uh, <laughs> if that's something that you know might happen for you uh, or if you've ever experienced that. It can be a little annoying. So, um, But I think that tight fit is probably good for the active noise cancellation. Anyways... That's kind of my abbreviated review of the Urbanista Miami. I mean, for 150 bucks, like I said, um, they offer the active noise cancellation. I think that's a pretty good uh, price range for what they are offering here. But it has the caveats with the sound. And for me, it has the caveat with the comfort. Someone's asking, Uncle Bick in, in chat is asking if they have a version of these for larger heads. And no... They do not. There is just this one version of them. So, you know, if you're concerned about that, something to consider. Um, that was my experience. But anyways, the Urbanista Miami's abbreviated review. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see. They, they actually have um, more coming down the line, like dealing with like solar and stuff, which is really interesting. I don't know. Really, uh, really interesting stuff that they're working on in the technology side of headphones. And I'm curious to see what they come up with. So, Urbanista Miami. More accessories for your yeah. Android devices. Absolutely. You know, I'm Bluetooth 5, so you get that range. Uh, I had it the other day where I was where I was listening to something and my phone was on the, it was inside and I was mowing the lawn and I had those on and like they stayed connected. So, that I thought that was good. That's, that's the future finally. Yeah. I mean, they, they didn't operate like that seamlessly all the time as far as Bluetooth was concerned. If I left my phone downstairs and went upstairs, things would get a little choppy. But I mean, that's just kind of Bluetooth. Bluetooth is just so weak when it comes to, you know, it is. passing through obstacles and stuff. So, yeah. anyways, Urbanista Miami, thank you cool. uh, for listening to my review. Ron, uh, well, what do you got? Yeah, well, speaking of some accessories, uh, we've got some new case leaks. So uh, cases for your phones that were leaked that appear to support and validate the drastic design change coming in the Google Pixel 6. Uh, we talked about this last week. Uh, Flo did not like it. Um, and whether or not this changes things, we're very curious to know, Flo. Does, do, do, does the new Pixel 6 design uh, with case do anything for you? No, I knew you were going to ask me about this. I made like whatever a big deal about it last week, but I still don't believe it. All right. Well, Stick so that's a it. good that's a good segue to David, sir. How do you feel about this Google Pixel 6 uh, leak and uh, potential new design paradigm for the Pixel? Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what happened. Audio listeners, uh, David is now being attacked by a cat. Uh, who yeah. has Poor also thing. Nobody will just let you. I know. I know. Nobody leaves me alone anymore. Uh, oh, God. I don't have any solo time. <laughs> it's okay. Your cat can can uh, get involved yeah, in the show. I would, I would like to hear what your cat thinks of the uh, leaked Google Pixel 6 design. <laughs> Well, if he is speaking for me, um, then he loves it, actually. Yeah. I, yeah. I, there was a quote I saw on Twitter that I thought was kind of funny, that it uh, it looked like someone at Google just went to Shenzhen and picked out a bunch of random parts and threw it together into a phone, which I think is the most Google thing you could possibly do, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> and I really like it because it feels kind of like a return to this, like... <laughs> out of nowhere outlandish hardware that is just kind of like very extreme and very, um, I don't know, like there's Unique. something about the magic simplicity of the like Pixel 4a that I really like, but also I kind of like it when Google decides to go a little out there, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and it almost looks, this specifically, I feel like almost looks like jewelry, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, if, yep. you sh if you show the, the back again with like the, uh, yeah. Stripe. Yeah. I don't know why, but the straight it makes it feel like a fashion accessory. It does. Which I kind of appreciate. Um, so so, so it'll be so yeah, these, if this is like the pro, that'll be interesting to me. Yeah, so these leaked cases and um for those who are listening to the audio version are are basically the 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 leaked renders we see are like a plastic case 
that snaps onto the back of the proposed or you know, supposed Google Six, but you see a, a vertical row along the top where the camera bulge would be. Um, and in the you know in in the leaked designs, it had you know the white background with the black camera stripe and then an orange stripe above it. Um, I do think that that you know after looking at you know we talked last week about how they've made the the power button that color of orange. Like there are little links back to Google's past here. And David, you're right. It does look like someone just went to Shenzhen and got it you know, like that one. But change it up. Uh, let me, I, I don't want to re relitigate what we talked about last week because Flo is going to throw something at me. But I, I, I'm all <laughs> for uh, mixing it up. And the fact that once you see this render come out, and if some, if this is false, and someone saw this leak come out and then quickly leaked a fake case to attach to this phone, I love that almost as much as that being the actual phone. Uh, but That's we'll true. see. Yeah. It's the journey, not 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 the uh, not the end result. Yeah, it's about exactly. the journey there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I'm curious, and I'm curious to see if it's a real thing because because we have we basically have a wager at this point. I mean, we're we're not betting anything specific, but. I love, oh, no, we, I love that we've no, drawn Jason, lines wait a in the sand. Wait a, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought, I thought whoever wins gets the phone. Oh, is that what? Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that, but um, who who's getting the... Okay. I'm not manifesting this design. I'm sorry. It's not. It's not happening. It's not flow approved. <laughs> it's not flow approved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, what what is flow approved then? Uh, well, I don't know about the Pixel A Buds, Pixel Buds A, Pixel A Buds, Pixel Buds A series. <laughs> there we go. But, uh, you know what? For a hundred dollars, I'm sure they could be flow approved. Uh, a lot of the reviews are saying they're not, they're not a bad buy for a hundred bucks. So the Pixel Buds A series officially released last week. They're more affordable version of the Pixel Buds. They look exactly the same or rather I should say a very similar design. There's no touch controls. Uh, you have to use voice commands and there are no LEDs on the buds themselves. So just give it up to God whether they work or not. No, I don't know, but it's nice to have a light, you know? Um, but they're a hundred bucks. So the lights save some, save you some money there. So internally the chipset is, has been changed to allow each earbud to connect directly to the phone previously, or rather on last year's one bud had to connect to the phone and the other would relay. This is actually, um, a thing that I have found is a thing with yeah. these true wireless earbuds Love is that one will that. be paired at it. It's like so annoying and it, yeah. It's frustrating. So interesting that they're doing this on the budget and that this is not happening on the high cost version. But um, it's worth noting that this Pixel Buds A series, they have no attention alerts. So they're not going to lower the sound when they detect like a dog barking or a car honking at you to get out of the way. Please look both ways before crossing the street. Remember to always stop, look, and listen. Stop. I drop, learned that and in roll. kindergarten. And I remembered it <laughs> since then. Uh, June 17th, these are available to buy in a variety of colors. Nice. So enjoy. Okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe we will enjoy. 90 bucks or $99 isn't, uh, isn't too shabby. No. Um, the, the Pixel Buds, the original Pixel Buds, did have some, uh, some issues. Jeff Jarvis on This Week in Google uh, talked many times about the few different hmm. times he tried with the Pixel Buds and ultimately ended up giving up on them uh, hmm. for various reasons. I, you know, I have Pixel Buds at home. Um, they aren't my initial go-to, um, but they are my backup. And when I'm using them, I'm rarely really disappointed with them. I like them. I love them for running uh, with a voice control. I think that's really a really nice feature for that. But so... I'm curious. Can I tell you, by the way, um, I did tweet about this, but I accidentally ran my Galaxy Buds to the wash, the first gen. Oh, yes, right. How'd yes. that go? Um, and just to make this more funny, I have an LG washer and dryer. <laughs> didn't kill it. Oh. Uh, the washer didn't kill it, at least. It actually, I let it dry for a day and the buds work just fine and nice. they're super clean. Well, maybe don't ever do that again. Don't think that that's the way that you it clean them. It was an accident, but, but 
worth noting that even those first gen pair, if you find them on sale, I'm telling you, they're still a really good buy. I even that first gen pair, I really like them. So I what still you- I I still use my first gen Google. I still use them for running, for mowing the lawn. And those are, but those are the ones that have the single wire, right? The, yeah, they have yeah. The, they have the cord. They do have the cord. They're not completely wireless. And the reason why is because I don't like the things in my ear, right? So yeah. these are them. These are the ones that just kind of settled right in. But they still yeah. work. The case is falling apart. Um, but like it's still, they're still chugging away. So nice. Okay, well then we have to go around. Uh, we have to finish the finish the uh, going around the horn here. Um, David, what are what are the earbuds that you use if you if you do so choose to share? Yeah, so I have a lot of feelings about these Pixel Buds A. Um, What's the hot take? What's the hot go? take? <laughs> it's not. It's actually not. It's not that steamy. It's a, it's actually pretty lukewarm. Um, the the first Pixel Buds, like the Pixel Buds two, the first Pixel Buds two, were probably my favorite truly wireless earbuds. At this point, I've used like literally everything. Yeah. Um, but their connection issues were so bad. Yeah. Uh, and just so consistently awful. And sometimes one would just stop playing music completely. And it j- there were just so many problems that eventually I did stop using them. Um, and I was on the Galaxy Buds Plus for a while. And then I moved to uh, these Jabra Elite 75Ts. Yep. And I didn't like them at first um, because I think their hardware feels a little bit cheap and they don't have touch controls and everything is kind of just like there's a physical button and whatever. Uh, and also, I I could never get the wireless charging on these to work if they're even meant to have it, which I think they are. But either way, um, I think the the like low end of these are insane, especially for how much Java charges for these, which is not that much mm-hmm. uh, compared to a lot of other earbuds. Anyway, so I actually also tweeted about the Pixel Buds um, A two A or whatever Pixel Buds A. What do they call it? Uh, I. Really wish that they had also released a refresh to the Pixel Buds that added the features that like made them better in the A, like the individual connections instead of the relay, um, mm-hmm. because that if it actually does fix the connection issues or it makes them better from what the reviews that I've read, it says it doesn't completely fix them, but it makes them it makes them quite a bit better for that. I would really like those. The problem is. They took out the touch controls. Mm-hmm. They took out the like automatic like volume adjustments like you were talking about, and they also took out wireless charging. And for me, um, a little bit ironic since I just said I can never get the wireless charging on the Jabros to work, but on <laughs> Galaxy Buds and Pixel Buds, one of the best things about them for me was wireless charging because um, at least at our apartment here, we have wireless charging pads sitting everywhere. And so if I can just like, I literally never have to think about the battery life on my truly wireless earbuds, which is really important for me. I can just like set them down before I go to bed and I grab them in the morning and that's it. Uh, And it's amazing. And I use those all the time on the Pixel Buds. They took them out. That sucks. Uh, The touch controls, I really, really, really like. Like I get that you can just reach in your pocket and like move the volume up and down. But the volume controls on the Pixel Buds, I thought especially were very intuitive and very fluid. Like there wasn't even like a... There wasn't even like a beep or a tone when you swipe them down. It was just kind of like this really nice ramp mm-hmm. or like ramp down. And like taking that out, just like, I guess it's nice that they're $80 cheaper, but, and then they made the connection better. But I really would have liked to see like a refresh to make the one seventy not the $179 ones uh, better as well. Just change the connection type and I would have bought them again. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Totally agree. Um, yeah, the, the the Pixel Buds volume uh, control is actually really good. I'm happy you pointed that out because it is a very kind of seamless and, it, like you said, intuitive experience. I totally agree. And for me, that. when I was working from home, like I would go on walks all the time um, just because I love walking and like going to different coffee shops to, to work from and stuff. And the difference between like either being in a coffee shop and then going outside or being in my apartment and then walking outside to go somewhere, you do have to adjust the volume fairly frequently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I never really got the the like AI volume control thing to work that well for me. I always felt like it was a little bit too loud or a little bit too quiet. Mm-hmm. So wanting to do that manually, um, I am kind of sad that they took that out. So yeah, I don't think I will be picking up a pair myself, but for people who don't really care about 
wireless charging, um, the fit is amazing and the sound is really good. The sound's very balanced, yeah. which I like. Yeah, agreed. I like the sound too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, up next, we're going to check out some app news. Might have something to do with Apple. I don't know. I like the Apple. App, some app. Apple. Old There's news. A, not as many Apple app puns in the market as no. I would have expected. Mm. Not nearly as yeah. many opportunities as a Huawei yeah. provides for, for Yeah, jokes. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or an on but, and, 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 Or an on and a, or, yeah. But before we get to the Apple, what's Google doing now? Yeah, Jason? no, we're gonna we're gonna make you wait for the Apple news because we know there's at least a small contingency of, of people who watch that the second we start talking about Apple, they turn the podcast off. So, you know, mm-hmm. you do you, but don't turn it off yet because we're gonna talk about Stadia a little bit. Um, <laughs> here we are. Stadia, you just you just always have to start laughing whenever you say, say we're talking about Stadia. I know. And then what a way to sell laughing. the show. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> One and a half years after the very first, like the initial launch of Stadia, already a year and a half later, uh, support is finally coming to Android TV <laughs> in an official sense. Uh, coming first to the Chromecast with Google TV, also to the NVIDIA Shield TV, NVIDIA Shield TV uh, Pro, Xiaomi Mi Box 3 and 4. There you go, Flo. Um, mm. Also, <laughs> by the way, the Anana FHD stick and the Anana UHD streaming device that we talked about wow, last week. Wow, Walmart streaming sticks. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, they're getting some Stadia action. Yeah. Uh, so you know, like their their product uh, that they are releasing might be underpowered, but not underpowered enough to stream video through the internet uh, in a way that allows you to play a video True. game. So there you go. True. Uh, all this arriving on June twenty third. Um, those uh, people who have other um, hardware are welcome to experiment to see if it works on theirs. You can opt in to experimental support if you install the app on your Android TV device and see if it works. You might get lucky. It might actually just work. Uh, just, you know, hadn't been like cleared officially to to run on that. But uh, check it out for yourself. And it does, as a reminder, it requires a Bluetooth controller or a Stadia controller. And it requires you to buy a game that exists solely in the cloud. And if Stadia ever dies, you don't get that game. So... You know, consider that too. You're paying full price for a game that could go away someday. Um, so you know, I I mean, I saw this and I was like, okay, cool. This the, I'm happy that that Stadia is now playable on Android TV. Why the heck was this not done sooner? This was just one of those weird examples of Google. Like, take care of like your your stuff because you mean before three people like key people left the team for Stadia because. I just, I don't, yeah. this is just one of those things, you know, Stadia, like, I, I don't want to believe that this is something that Google, you know, released and then two years later kills. I don't want to believe that because, I, you know, I mean, I was, I was kind of, I've been interested and excited about Stadia conceptually, but like other companies, let's, let's just say Apple because they're coming up next. Like Apple would generally do something in this realm and be sure that when they're launching their thing, their thing works on their other things. And Google yep. just did not do that. I mean, they did that no. for some of their things, but not the living room thing. And that's where you no. want to play your video games. So why? No, I will. I will. For the most part, Jason, you are correct. And especially in terms of the hardware side of things. But anybody who is a content creator and a podcaster who's been navigating Apple and this new podcast next chapter, it has been one of the worst rollouts I've ever seen from a company like as at, at like yep. okay it's been very bad not, hardware is not involved though it is all it is all software it's all platform it's all content creators and that sort of thing but it is it, apple does Personnel is not leaving. perfect yeah, th- yeah right fair enough absolutely yeah. and I, I don't mean to imply that for sure but but when it comes to their hardware i feel like often that's kind of the allure and that's kind of the beauty of a lot of what Apple offers. They really are devoted to their hardware ecosystem and, you know, everything kind of running relatively fluidly and smoothly between them. And this was just, I mean, this just seemed very glaring to me to launch Stadia 
in in a you know in this fashion and a year and a half later you're getting support for android tv it's like really or google tv or whatever the heck they're calling it now um like why why did it have to take that long i don't get it what where do you fall on on the stadia thing david i'm curious yeah so <laughs> i've been really mixed on this um i reviewed stadia obviously when it first came out and it was okay you know, it, had, it, it would play really fine for a while and then it would have some issues uh, after a little bit and it's just not really consistently smooth. And I did a check-in a year later and it was pretty much exactly the same, which was not super promising uh, on a really good Wi-Fi connection. But the biggest thing for me that has been really glaring is I firmly think that the Google TV, the Chromecast with Google TV is like one of the best $50 that you can spend ever in your tech life. Uh, I've been kind of promoting Chromecasts ever since they came out as those little, you know, first generation mm -hmm. dongles because they were $20 and, it, oh, yeah. and the idea, the idea of like streaming content over the internet, over a network to your thing, instead of passing it over Bluetooth or something like that is just much more stable. And it's, it feels almost magical. Like when you, when you throw something from your phone to your TV, it still kind of feels magical in 2021, which is quite surprising. But uh, I remember doing the briefing for the Chromecast with Google TV. And at the very end of the briefing, they asked me if there was any more questions. And I was about to log off. And I was like, wait, oh, yeah, Stadia works on this, right? And they're like, um, it, it's coming soon. And I said, oh. like, And I was just like, wait, so your Chromecast 4K, which you launched like four or five years ago, is what ships with this. But your newest Chromecast that you're promoting does not work with Stadia. And they were like, yeah, it's coming soon, it's coming soon. And I was like, okay, well, hopefully it'll come soon. It didn't come soon. I'm glad it's coming now, but it didn't come soon enough. And uh, at this point, it, not to say that not putting Stadia on Chromecast with Google TV was uh, what, I don't want to say killed Stadia, because Stadia's not dead, but like Flo said, three core people have left recently. Many mm -hmm. people have left over the course of oh, yeah. basically since its inception. Uh, it's not a good look for, for you to not put this now m major product that you sell on the newest version of the thing that is supposed to run your product on the biggest screen that you have. It, it's just, like you said, Jason, like Couldn't agree more. Apple, Apple kind of takes a lot of time to make sure that its products are cohesive between systems. And um, we actually just put a video live today that I wrote a big part of yesterday about that main thing. Google can be a lot more innovative faster and get stuff out faster because its teams are very siloed and they don't really have to work together and they don't really have like this mm. product stack that they just need to like, you know, this team needs to make sure they talk to the other team. Like for example, um, at WWDC, you get a text that has a link in it. And next time you open the, the Apple news app, there's a for you section that's like, there's this link of this article that you should read that you got a text from or the the photo album does the same thing. Someone texts you and it's like for you and it's like these apps all talk together. When was the last time a Google app talked to another Google app? That's the oh. entire reason we have 80 different chat apps on Android is because instead of just saying like, hey, one main chat app, why don't you have all these other apps that need chat link into the main chat app? They just add chat into their own app because they think it's easier because their teams don't coordinate. No, and don't. like when the Stadia team is not coordinating with the Chromecast team, which is the main platform that you're meant to run Stadia on, you know you have a problem. Yeah, <laughs> and you just time. need it. so it's it's a it's a little bit of a catch twenty two because like I said, the silo teams can lead to some really amazing products. I think Google has put out some stuff that Apple would never be able to put out in a timely manner or you know, get better over a faster period of time. But Apple is just really good at that. Like when it launches a product, it's like this product works on all of our products. The service that we're launching is going to be available across all your devices and it plugs into all your devices. So I don't know. Yeah. It's sad because I love Chromecast so much and I tell people all the time, like if you want a streaming stick, get a Chromecast with Google TV because the experience is amazing. Like they they really did do a great job with the UI yeah. and the platform on that and being able to, uh, we actually bought one for ourselves because we reviewed one and then I was like, I'm gonna buy one. So I did. Being able to like press the Google Assistant button and say, I wanna watch this show and it shows you 
what service it is on across like all of the services and then you can just log in through the Android TV app and you're there. It's so great. Like uh, we had had this TiVo stick that like, believe it or not, TiVo is still around. Their entire shtick was that they had a stick <laughs> that did that, that told you what service the thing was on and they would bring you to that service and let you play it. Now the Chromecast does it. So the Chromecast lets you use all these other streaming services, but then also just throw things from your phone onto your TV. It's just like this ultimate magical hub that works with all streaming. And it even has Apple TV support now. So I really don't see a reason not to have one. Mm-hmm. So. And it, it is so good. And it is, um, I, I echo that. And it's um, my only frustration with it is that on the main screen, when you go to resume something that you're watching, and maybe this is more on the app side than on the Chromecast side, but like I've got screaming toddlers who want to watch Frozen. And when I hit resume from the Google, from the Chromecast screen, it goes into Disney Plus, but it still makes me identify which profile I'm logging mm. in as. And so mm-hmm. it's like, no, just remember that I'm on this profile and keep it. I, I even got rid of a profile on the app just to see if it would bypass it, but it wouldn't. Um, mm-hmm. And the same thing with HBO Max, like any, like a lot of these apps that now have like, who's watching? We're going to cater the experience. That is like one uh, obstacle to actually getting to the content from that Chromecast experience, but yeah. I'm sure it will evolve and as they figure out how to work with it. Um, but it, it, the whole thing about Stadia and Chromecast and like the what at the end of the day when Flo eventually writes a book about all this stuff in like 10 years, um, the, I'm sure she will, um, the, the story will be that Google had a ton of potential and they couldn't help themselves get to the finish line. The left hand never knows what the right hand is doing. They don't know how to coordinate. They don't know how to um, have a consolidated product that like is is has that vision and goes back to Jason, what you're saying that Apple has been able to do, right? Because they're just so focused on we're doing this thing and we're not thinking, you know, when you think about the potential of that Chromecast stick with a gaming platform for the past year plus, oh my God, just left money on the table. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Mm-hmm. Especially in that Also initial talking push. to a leather... Yeah. Uh, t- talking to a lot of Google engineers, there's this um, there's this kind of internal saying that the best way to get a promotion is to launch a product, uh, mm. and that's terrible because you launch you you lead up to a product, you launch the product, you move to a different team at Google, and that product falls by the wayside and yep. doesn't get supported and eventually gets killed, All and that's why we have the lost. killed by Google Twitter account. Yep. So. Yep. Absolutely. Friend of, friend of the show. Friend of the friend show. Of the show. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I was going to point that out. Uh, yeah, interesting. Um, and, yeah, Google, we're, we sound critical, but it's because we want. Because we love. We, we love. We want we love. you to, to uh, excel. And, we want to throw money at you. Yeah, yeah. totally. We yeah. want everybody to throw money at you. Maybe not everybody. We just, mm. we just want you. We just want what we know you're capable of. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, now is the part of the app segment where we do talk a little bit about Apple, but I promise it's Android related also. Flo, you got the first one. I told Jason maybe we'd want to put this in the rundown today, but basically, I don't know if you guys were watching WWDC yesterday. I had to um, because I was live blogging, but I found out that we're getting FaceTime. Not exactly the FaceTime that you're thinking of, and this is not like getting iMessages where everything is just opened up and that's it. Everybody's going to play nice together. It's just that now if your friend on an Apple device wants you to chat through FaceTime, they can send you a link. And just like on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, you can hop into the link, hop into the little room through your Android browser, or if you're on Windows, you could do that there too, and, uh, and have a FaceTime chat. That's it's that's really that not live until again, iOS 15, which I guess, depending on when the stuff comes out, is like this fall. So around the time Android 12 mm, maybe hits, okay. I'm assuming I forgot. Yeah, I don't really pay attention to iOS, but I know that when a good thing comes through, it excites me. Mm. So. Yeah, I'll Can be- I also make a note that yeah. they decided, of course, to use like. Remember when teardrop notches were popular and and they were super ugly and of course yep. Apple decided to use an Android phone from like three to four years ago. <laughs> You're with right. The ugly I know. Style of oh my god! Wait, when's the they last would, time we saw that specific teardrop? That. Totally. You know, you yeah, know they're put it, they're doing their best to make it look as crappy as possible. That's like yeah, that's they like really hundred dollar like 
like Huawei phone or something. Yes. Like a two hundred dollar. Like look at that giant think- chin. Navigation <laughs> buttons. Like come oh, on. Oh boy, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I think my my editor kept it in the caption, but I had written like it isn't the best mock up of an Android device uh, because like that was just it was a little rude. But (laughs) I'm not I'm not I don't put it past them. I'm not surprised they do this stuff all the time. It's uh, so (laughs) whatever. At least now, you know, I had made so there's this whole thing with a lot of my friends to get them to use Google Duo. And I had used my best friend as an example in this article. And then she texted me after the uh, story went live and said, but for you, I downloaded and installed Google Duo. Oh, wow. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, oh, well. but also let's just thank you for my bestie for downloading Google Duo. and I mean, that truly is the best to manifest friend. I would- that. I wouldn't, I, I, as I've said many times in the show, I forced everyone onto WhatsApp before I would do Duo because Duo was painful. So it's like, well, I did it that WhatsApp got the with, job done. It was hard with WhatsApp because you never know if the person's available. <sighs> anyway. Fair. But that's, that's their own, that's their choice. But I was anyway. somehow able to get like literally everyone I know onto Telegram. I don't know how this wow, happens, this, but like wow. we just all. Yeah, we had like some sort of media exodus where we told all of the PR people that we knew that we wouldn't be able to be contacted on WhatsApp anymore. And if they wanted to talk to us, they had to be on Telegram. And now nice. not only have I got like all of my New York reporter friends on Telegram, but like all of my friends in my entire life, which is really surprising. Yeah. But I didn't think it yeah, could ever happen, honestly. I just I, – my uh, my – Co-founder at, at my startup recently had a, um, a messaging meltdown uh, because we we rolled it for Scorbit. We rolled out a, uh, a Discord, much like Twit, because uh, a lot of active community there. And he's just like listed off all the different ways people can get in touch with them. And I'm like, yeah, I'm right there with you. It's just from Messenger to WhatsApp to SMS to to Slack to Discord to Facebook Messenger to, to, to yeah. Instagram and DMs. That is so exactly like, oh, just, why yeah. the focus modes on iOS 15 are probably the most important, exciting update for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's not, Don't get in contact with me when I'm in work mode. Don't talk to it's me. Not more, it's not more exciting than AirTags, David? Because um, also, right before WWDC, Apple announced that they're working on an Android app, Gasp, uh, for detecting AirTags and, and Find My networking-enabled devices. Um, and it's expected to come out later this year. Um, and this is basically because uh, AirTags launched with limited support for Android um, and only devices with NFC uh, and only when an air tag is in lost mode. So with these movements, is Apple getting a little more Android friendly or are they just doing what they have to uh, to ensure that they just exist in the world with the full range of potential customers? I think this is an awkward thing because when air tags launched, it did feel like they just were living in this world where they pretended that Android phones didn't exist because you yep. could you could use your Android phone to like scan it, but it would just bring you to a website telling you how to disable it and take the battery out. Right. Which if you're a thief and you have an Android phone, that's actually beneficial to you <laughs> instead of like ha- helping a person find their, uh, their air tag. The problem with this is like, good, I'm glad that they are making an Android app. Uh, and But at the same time, like I wonder how much crossover those two groups have. Um, do you know, I didn't, I didn't read an into this enough. Can you use AirTags now? Can you link them to an Android phone? But I'm guessing not. Is no, it just I don't to, believe that you can. No, I don't think yeah, you if can. You can't, yeah. If you can't, then what Android user is going to download the AirTags app? Yeah, I mean, it, will the app, whenever it comes out, will it allow for that? I guess that's that's a question. That I kind of doubt it. I, I doubt, doubt it. Yeah, I, I doubt like it too. Apple would allow Android phones into their ecosystem, especially when they mock them up like that. Yeah, totally. Low this this low seems blow. this seems more like yeah, we're giving you the ability to to find these things easier or or something along those lines. But yeah, yeah. Um, but don't know don't know what that'll be once it launches. But mm. it's not like Apple hasn't created apps you know with full feature sets for Android before Apple Music. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But they sell yes. a lot of stuff through Apple Music, so I suppose that makes sense. But and also and also like we mentioned on Chromecast, the fact that there's an Apple TV Android TV app, like that, yeah. like that is uh, I, I I shocked me when I discovered that. Yeah, so. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's a newer ish thing though. 
Mm. Like they they they, they, sure. they fight to be on each other's platforms all the time, and I think it was only recently that Google TV finally got the Apple TV app. But yeah. I think it depends on like who has it's the balance of power as like who has more power in the situation. Yeah, right. Like for Apple Music, like they're fighting against like Spotify to get as many subscribers as possible. So being on Android makes a lot of sense because there so. are yeah, a yeah. decent amount of people who have an Android phone but have a MacBook. Like a MacBook is a very popular laptop. And if you hit the music button on the MacBook and then you have Apple Music, of course you're going to want to use it on your phone too if you just happen to do that instead of doing Spotify. But whereas something like AirTags, like, I mean, maybe people will buy AirTags if they have Android phones because, of course, they are, like, the best finders on the market. But at the same time, they're not making that much money on the hardware. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's more about, like, it's AirTags, in my opinion, If for another little mini hot take, is much more about uh, getting people, giving people another reason to buy into other Apple hardware. Because the harder the fact that they're selling them for thirty dollars each, and you're only need, gonna need to own like probably one or two Max, that's not making them their two trillion dollars. That's mm, just no. getting other that's getting people to buy more Apple hardware so that it's easier for them to find the stuff that is connected to their AirTags. So it's just another ecosystem lock, but that's a whole other story. Man, you're that's their whole thing, but that's their whole thing, and and. Anyway, we're 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 veered way off into Apple territory. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> David's yeah. takes are jalapeno. That's how hot they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. When we uh, well, yeah. Up next, we're, we're not going anywhere. Up next, some of your emails. Triple A at twit.tv, three four seven show AAA. We have been getting a couple of voicemails. They're just like now. I, I hate it because I feel like a, I'm flip flopping. But now they're like super short. It's like, hey, 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 so da, 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 da. okay, bye. And it's like five or seven seconds. Like, well, there's nothing there. So, you know, <laughs> leave us a voice message, less than 30 seconds, but some substance. Some yeah, to talk you can about. call and say, hey, all about Android crew today. God, today was just like a really rough day with my chili cheese fries. But I had a question about my Samsung device. Like, that's fine. Yeah, tell us about your chili cheese fries, yeah. especially right now when I'm super hungry because it makes me want to eat <laughs> Me too. Fries. That's why I mentioned it. Ooh. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Start with uh, a fan. This is how uh, he or she signed it. Fan from Niagara, Ontario, Canada says, I have to say that I am an avid listener and listened to your show for many years. I heard Ron talk about the Indiegogo a, a wireless device a few uh, months ago. This is the uh, Android Auto wireless device. And was excited since I ordered one a few months before him. So I thought I would send you my thoughts after about five months of use. The device is awesome. Works exactly as described. When I get in my car and start driving, the AA interface popped up on my screen before I left my driveway. It is wonderful having AA every drive. This uh this leaving my phone in my pocket. Oh, while leaving my phone in my pocket. I should say at first, the AA wireless device did not work with my car or my situation very well. My car or truck is a 2020 Ram 1500 and the USB port has power all the time, even when the key is removed. Ooh, that doesn't sound safe. So the AA wireless has power all the time. So my phone was always trying to connect to my truck and my calls would be routed to my truck every time I was in my house. It was very annoying. Oh, I love it. So I had to unplug the wireless device from my truck every time. This just made me leaving AA wireless unplugged and not using it. Then a few weeks ago, they had an OTA update that fixed this. And now my phone only connects when my car is on. I am so happy about this. It is a great device. And Ron, you will be very happy with it. Well, this is great to hear. Um, and I'm so excited to hear about it. that's very funny about the phone continually be connected to your car. Um, I have not received my AA wireless device yet. Um, the latest update we got on June 5th uh, starts off with, I'm afraid we do not have good news. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you get that uh, so update, you know it's bad. Yeah, so basically the, 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 the guys behind AA wireless, they're working. They've got uh, 7,000 units that are waiting to ship out as people who are supposed to receive them in March, April, and May, of which I was in the April group, I believe. Uh, they've got, they, they're having basically factory finishing the production issues, um, and they're keeping us posted. So hopefully the, the 7,000 units they've got that are waiting to get shipped out get finished, and I get mine soon. Uh, they think we should have it uh, this month, I hope, or later this month. So uh, yeah. we will see. Cool. 
Can't wait to hear mm. all about it. Yep, me too. Mm. Can't wait to play with it. Because mm. Lord knows, Lord knows, I've actually, I've been so my car experience has been so like on the go and like short drives, not long drives. Yeah. That the time it takes to plug the USB cable in the USB phone and wait for it to all connect and relaunch, I've I've just been using Bluetooth straight into the head unit and doing it that way and and staying wireless so I, i'm excited to get this so i can have that experience but with the full android auto experience yeah so nice Flo, you got the next one all right this is incredibly timely actually so uh, will from tigard oregon writes i just got done listening to the email from the italian student who wanted to work on a privacy focused home hub that hub is hubitat I've been running mine for almost two years and it's been pretty good. I switched from Wink when they started to go south and couldn't afford to pay their employees. Ouch. Uh, as a side note, Wink is no longer a company, just for anybody who's wondering. Um, well, actually, I think they are a company. But anyway, not making hubs anymore. Hubitat does require some tinkering, but there are a ton of helpful articles on their site to get people up to speed and get their products working. Will. Uh, Will, thank you for writing in today. Uh, thank you for writing that in. Actually, today I wrote about the Samsung Smart Things big UI update that they did, and um, that led me down a rabbit hole. To I've actually was kind of not aware of all the stuff that was going on with with Smart Things. I guess I was ignoring all the email that they were sending me. But two other people mentioned Hubitat today to me, so it turns out that this is something that I'm going to have to check out. Mm. And so I guess at this point, all I can say is check back here later. Check gizmodo.com later. I'm probably going to set this up. I got to yeah. see what this is all about. Yeah. I think you have your next, your next lead for your next yeah. article. Yeah. There it is. It's <laughs> how it happens. Yeah. It's how the sausage is I made. Know. Yeah. Well. Something in the stars today just brought it to me. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Will. All right. Will, old school BOL listener, Jason. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Nice to see that. That's pretty cool. That was a while I'm ago. An, for those at home, I'm an old school BOL listener. That's how I, <laughs> that's how I found That's how I met Jason. I met him when he was working at CNET on Buzz Out Loud. That's right. My first podcast so, <laughs> that I listened to ever. Right. Um, and awesome. then proceeded to rip the rip the format off and repurpose it for iFanboy in 2005. <laughs> hey, what works works. works. Exactly. I learned Go I learned from it. the best. I told Tom, <laughs> Tom numerous times that uh, yeah, I own. Anyway, all right. So uh, that is great timing because that leads us to our. Oh, <laughs> Burke just yelled out. Oh, <laughs> Burke, <He's> our. <laughs> It's email. It's, don't, he's, he's pulling the cord. He's trying to start the engine. He's <laughs> literally has to plug in the email of the week button machine. There we go. There, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Burke. Plugged Finally, in. Finally, our, e our email of the week. Uh, this one comes to us from Lucas, uh, who says, I was listening to one of the emails of the week. Email of the week, but still, I was listening to one of the emails from last week's episode about development on Chrome. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, <laughs> about development on a Chromebook. Well, a few years ago, I bought myself an Acer Chromebook Spin 13, and it is seriously one of the best devices I've purchased in a long time. One of the reasons I love it so much is it's the support for Linux apps. Chrome OS has something called Crostini that essentially installs a small containerized version of Debian alongside Chrome OS. I'm not sure how they do it but you can also run any kind of graphical Linux app on it and it just shows up fairly seamlessly in a window. With all this, I actually have a pretty sweet development environment. I'm able to customize my terminal because it uses Bash. I'm also able to install all my necessary development tools such as JVM, Python, Runtime, Git, Vim, and Docker. Uh, pro tip, be aware of your Chromebook CPU architecture since that could limit what Docker images you can use. And thanks to the APT package manager, finally I can install various IDEs and text editors like IntelliJ, IntelliJ PyCharm, and Sublime. They, there definitely have been some rough patches, but the Crostini development has been going pretty strong and things have gotten a lot better over the years. Some graphical Linux apps like dBeaver don't work that well or just completely broken, but overall my Chromebook has been a great tool for working on pet projects. Um, and, and that comes to us from Lucas. We thank you, Lucas. That's a great response to our email last week, uh, which came from uh, where was that? Was that that was that was such a big uh, episode for for uh, uh, emails last week? I'm trying to find it, but um, 
uh, was it Soham? Soham's email, yes, about about uh, looking to be able to install Python That's onto right. a Chromebook. So Soham, take a look at the uh, take a look at Crostini and all the great stuff you can do on an Acer uh, Chromebook Spin 13. Um, and also, just a fun uh, kind of note, uh, Peter Yasuda linked linked us to Kevin Toffel. Also, friend of the show, uh, Kevin mm -hmm. Toffel's article on aboutchromebooks.com, uh, where he talked all about using a Chromebook for programming. So, if you look, go to aboutchromebooks.com, uh, you can find that the article is, uh, is "Can you learn? Uh, can you learn to code in a college computer science program with a Chromebook?" Uh, which is a great uh, piece and a good positioning of that. Um, and it's cool to hear about folks doing development on Chromebooks. That's awesome. It's it's glad. Yeah. It's it's good to hear that that it, it, that it is a flexible enough device. Uh, to do that. So, uh, David, do you have, do you have any Chromebook experience? So how do you feel about Chromebooks in general? I do. Um, I actually really like Chromebooks a lot. I got a Pixel Book like pretty soon after they were out, um, which I know that they're quite expensive for for Chromebooks. Um, but I like them a lot because I think a majority of people can do a lot of their work on Chromebooks. Um, and now that they have support for like a lot of different things that you might need to do. Also, uh, if you think that you need like Photoshop or all these very powerful like photo editing apps or like specific apps that you can't find anywhere else, you may be surprised to find that there are a lot of web apps that can do what a lot of these dedicated desktop apps can do. So Pixlr. you should look into that stuff. Yeah, Pixlr, I yeah. was um, just, yes, uh, this morning actually, um, our friend uh, Julian Chitaku at Wired, I don't know if you, you guys probably know him. Um, he's a friend of mine, and we have a Telegram group with a bunch of people. And we have a dumb, uh, I make a lot of Telegram stickers for our Telegram group. And he asked me to make this Telegram sticker of him. And I just went to remove.bg. And instead of needing Photoshop and going into Photoshop and doing all the selections and then trying to get rid of the alpha background and turning it into a PNG and all this stuff, there's a website that you can just throw up any JPEG and it removes the background as a PNG and turns it into a PNG in like half a second and it's super what? easy. So and for those of you, of, a lot of stuff those like of you at home, it's remove.bg. That's the website. Yeah. It's awesome. It works, I've used this. It actually works really, really well. Like there was like very fine hair and it just did a great job. What? Um, very, yeah, it's crazy good. So I'm just saying like surprising. A lot of people ask me like, cause I, I tend to be a very fast memer. Um, through creating memes and people ask me how I do it so quickly. And honestly, if you just Google, like do this online, there's a lot of tools that'll just do a lot of there's things. There's so you. much like the, the, the cloud, <laughs> I mean, it's so cheesy to say cloud computing, but like we've been able, they've been able to break apart how to do these functions and put them in the web browser. And like, honestly, the, the sort of stuff that you can do, not even just like remove BG, but Pixlr and, and uh, what, mm -hmm. let's say the one, Fotor. Um, and things like that. A lot of those online photo editors, like I, my brain couldn't even fathom it 15 years ago of doing that inside of a browser, right? Like mm. it, it is, it, it, it is such a testament to how far we've come, you know, and we kind of somewhat take it for granted, but like, you know, stuff that it took, you know, was really hard to do, like removing a background in Photoshop, really painful for anybody who's done that. Um, this now can just do it. You just upload it, does it for free. It's amazing. That is amazing. I just, yeah, yeah I just tried it on an image and yeah, that was I like I'm it's floored crazy, on that. Right? It's, yes. pr it's pretty it's pretty dang good and it like even if you have fine details it can get around it pretty yeah. easily. So actually a lot of the times it's better than me manually doing it in Photoshop and it's like 50 times faster. So Yeah, right. That's recommended. Wow. That's that's pretty <laughs> awesome. Thank you for yeah. that. Sweet. All right. Well, uh thank you Lucas and I also and I guess also by extension Peter Yasuda. Yeah, and Ron, you can you can finish that because I don't want to steal your thunder. Yes. Well, thank you, Lucas, because you are the email. The week. <laughs> it's a, it's like a, it's like a book. You you're the cover, and then you're the the, yeah. the back end of the of the book we need, as well. So you we you need, need to, to do T-shirts that say all about Android email of the week, and it has like a trumpet underneath it or something like that. <laughs> there's another there's another idea. No, it just goes email of the. Yeah, email of the dot, 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 and the backs is weak. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have Love too it. many ideas for shirts and not enough shirts. Um, all right. Well, we have reached the end of this episode of All About Android. And, David, it's been, as it always is, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you for giving us a couple hours of your time tonight. 
uh, in your stark white room there. Um, tell people what you want them to know, uh, where they can find what you, where they can find you. If you if you want to point them to anything in particular, this is your opportunity to do sure. that. Um, cool. Well, you should uh, watch our videos um, at MKBHD on YouTube and listen to us on the Waveform podcast. I'm on there pretty frequently now, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, if you want to find my personal stuff, it is at DervidML on Twitter, as you can see if you're watching over here, if you're watching the video, uh, if you're listening, that it's D U R V I D I M E L. I'm also on Instagram as David ML, even though I post like twice a year, but I do post a lot of stories. And then if you just want to see everything, even though I am very slow to update it, uh, I got davidml.com, which is my website. So Radical. Thank yep. you again, David. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thank we'll, you guys. Uh, yeah. Good, to, good to be on again. Right on. Been good fun. to see you. Uh, maybe, maybe someday in the future we'll see you in person again. Who the heck knows? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if I ever go to an event ever again in my life. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Flo, what about you? What do you want to point people to? Um, well, hey, yesterday I had the Amazon Echo Show 8 review go up. They have a second generation smart speaker. And, okay, I had to make sure. I forgot. That's not the wake word. And it's right here next to me. Anyway, go check that out. It's at gizmodo.com. Uh, that posted actually this morning. Sorry, not yesterday, this morning. So cool. go check that out. Excellent. Read all of Flo's awesome work on gizmodo.com. Yes, please. I'm tired. <laughs> Read my work. Support me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Flo. What about you, Ron? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at RonXO or on Instagram at RonXO. Um, and go check out Scorebit, available in the Google Play Store. If you play pinball and want to keep track of your scores, um, it's a fun app. We have a big, big, big release that we've been working on coming up. Um, working on the release notes actually just tonight. Um, so I hope to share that with you all soon. And go to scorebit.io where you can order your device to plug into your pinball machine uh, and keep track of your scores. So it's all at scorebit.io. So. Excellent. Keep up the great work there. Um, big thanks to Burke behind the monitor and and then behind the, his monitor and then behind the microphone. There's like three layers of technology. Behind the mask. Behind the mask as well. Uh, thank you, Burke. Also, thanks to Victor, who is even further behind the scenes editing the show and bringing it to you, uh, giving you a downloadable version of the show so you don't have to be sitting here in the studio where you're not really allowed anyways right now. So I'm sorry about that. But we'll give you the podcast instead to make it up for um, Club Twit, if you hadn't heard, twit.tv slash Club Twit, ad-free, uh, all of our shows ad-free. It's a subscription tier for seven bucks a month. You get all of our shows with no ads, exclusive Twit Plus podcast content, tons of extra content there, and then a members-only Discord channel that we have a lot of fun with. So go check it out, twit.tv slash Club Twit, and join the club. And otherwise, that is it for this week's episode. We had a lot of fun this week. We plan to have a lot more fun each and every week going forward. So check us out every Tuesday evening, twit.tv slash AAA to subscribe. And that's really about it. We'll see you next time on All About Android. Bye, everybody. Excited wave. <laughs> Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop, it's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.